to arise on some issues I was thinking about and try to get your response and maybe even some action on this topic later on. Uh, so, okay, so it is recording? It is recording. Okay. Okay. So, yeah, so my name is Peter. I, uh, some of them, some of you maybe remember me from two, two days ago. <laughs> or maybe not. <laughs> or maybe not after the, the, this night. So, again, I'm Peter from Vienna. Uh, um, last time I talked about uh, mathematics, mathematics for our protocols. So today I will. And for some ideas, they are more or less just rise on questions, issues. I was thinking about uh, why I was discussing things with other uh, networks, uh, for example, and, and especially when thinking about applications over our networks. So, for example, uh, we all uh, probably agree that uh, we have networks for so that people will be able to have some applications over it. Um, and that we have networks because we like that uh, people can build them themselves, not that uh, some centralized uh, organization is building it for them. Um, but we cannot agree on which protocol is good for that, uh, so we have battles and fight uh, over each other and try to find who will stand up. But uh, the other solution would be to make our protocols uh, interoperable so that people in s the same city could use the different protocols but still mesh together. And this is, I think, something we might or should start thinking about. So that we are diverse, we have different between protocols, uh, but that, ma uh, that we should, uh, so that our equipment should know how to talk with each other, even if, you, uh, if the other equipment that and my professor is there and uh, my friends are going to do this day, but, uh, Why is this important? It's because, for example, last year uh, we were doing the, uh, for the Google Summer of Code uh, application for Android where we wanted to make it like uh, that people will just press a button and will make a mesh network on him and you'll be able to other people, if they press the button, their Android phones to make them automatically. Now the problem was, the question was, okay, which protocol we should use for that? Because we wanted to think, we wanted the first way that they mesh together and the second thing that they mesh with the existing nodes from the possible community networks around uh, them. Um, and then what, what, the, what the person is probably moving around the board uh, or he doesn't know or she doesn't know which protocols is in that uh, community or if there is even a community and so on, so this should be done automatically. Um, and so which one to choose and that's the problem. Um, so you can choose uh, all of them and run all of them, but even if you run all of them on your Android phone or mobile phone or laptop, you, you, can, you still have problems because you have se uh, separation of the network. So you can, as one client, which runs four the protocols, you see one node from each from one network and the other nodes from the other network, but they cannot see each other. Um, and and, and yeah, yeah, you can run all of them. So what, what was the idea? Uh, we came about for a solution would be that you have to have like powerful nodes or nodes which have more power so that they can run multiple uh, routes and that all routes from one uh, for uh, one uh, routing protocol would be ready to be in other routing protocols. So most of us, our uh, routing protocols on the have this uh, support for announcing routes. I don't know how, how would this be solved in Batman uh, on there too, so that, I don't know, you have, um, and, and, but this is the idea, no? so, um, that our protocols should have some common mobility of um, publishing which should they know about, so that our other routing protocols running on the same machine can um, republish this um, along. And the other question is how to do this same thing without making routing loops, loops and similar things. Yeah? Isn't that what Quagga is about? Uh, yeah, but it doesn't it, uh, the question is, does it, isn't it too bloated for the um, small routing protocols? 
uh, for the small devices and so on. Yeah? So what they are doing is a particular instance of a technique known as redistribution. What? What? It's called redistribution. Yeah, moving the data. And redistribution is something that uh, you can easily do in a routine demon. That will have been doing it from the beginning. Uh, with OSR, you need to use the uh, OSR plugin. Okay. Not, I don't know how Batman does it. But those are standard techniques that have been used for the last 30 years. Okay, and uh, is, has anybody tried to do it on the uh, routers itself, so on the smaller nodes? I know from the Athens network that they use the OSR program. Okay. Because they use lots of information. Yeah. Okay, but it, it is uh, two directional, so in the sense that uh, so you have so what I would like you know that in one in one city two meshes one is better and the other one is OSR with okay that the nose who uh, is from OSR start announcing the better mesh or the other mesh and vice versa yes but you need other ways to ensure the lack of loops if you do it in two directions. You run the risk, there is no yeah. longer any cross protocol loop avoidance mechanism. So you need other ways, you need to think in order to avoid loops. Yeah, um, that's the question. Our goal, of course, is to make, is to prevent people from thinking, yeah. to build yeah. things that are completely automatic, because exactly. thinking is difficult, especially today. Uh, but, uh, so it goes a little bit against what we're doing. But in principle, yes. Sure. As long as we uh, have a single IP range for every routing protocol, Loop should, shouldn't be a problem because because, because of the subnet, the target addresses, we already know which is the target subnet. So at some point we will get to a gateway that announces this address or this subnet range and then transfer to another routing protocol. The route might not be optimal because if you have an OSR cloud and a Batman cloud, they both, and you have multiple points where you yeah. announce each other's prefixes, then you might have an um, uh, OSR will try to do its best to reach the next gateway point. Batman will try to do the best to do it, but uh, the combination might not be optimal, but it still should be loop free. Mm -hmm. If you move them to into the same IP range, I'm not sh really sure. Yeah, but, okay, no, no, but, 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 but we shouldn't do that in any case. Uh, so. Yeah, but uh, still, yeah. then I don't. As long as every IP address is either in, let's say, Batman net or the Babel net or the OSR net, it should be there should be no possible loop because you or you stay in your network and then somewhere you have to jump into the other one. The problem would only be if you want to have some kind of intermediate mesh. So you have, for example, you have a, a Babel network connected to an OSR network and another part of the OSR network is co connected to the Batman network. And now we want to route from the Babel to the Batman network. And so you have to cross multiple of these clouds. That can be a little bit more problematic. <coughs> you can have loops just with two uh, networks. Can you draw that? I don't think Why? so. How? <laughs> How strong? Yeah, yeah. 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 The, the problem is how do you, when you do redistribution, you need to map metrics from one universe into the other one. No, you're just saying no, I'm here. No metric. Yeah. Just um, just gateways to the other yeah. Yeah. Maybe with the distance, but it's just one way. With the target address, you have already said that's my target gateway, and I may be staying in my local network, but at some point I jump to the other one, but I will never jump back. We might want to have the gentleman from He's doing that. Oh, sorry? <laughs> <laughs> Someone, said the the Someone said the word BGP and no, I use distribution, there. so you should get a board. Oh, so sorry, I shouldn't. That's very similar to the idea with what we were discussing yesterday in the evening, right? So, like, uh, how to get the line of to uh, accept each other, uh, how to have proper gateways or not gateways. <laughs> And I guess there's lots and lots and lots of experience with BGP. Yeah. Though typically, uh, I would say with BGP, you don't necessarily want to redistribute routes while it is possible. Uh, typically, you want to just summarize all of the routes you've received from your IGP. So if you have this 27, this 27, this collection of 24s, typically, or hopefully, this is all 
uh, you can be aggregated into one prefix. And so that is the prefix you would advertise via BGP, and then once it comes into the router, um, those other routes are coming in to the uh, routing information base and the forwarding information base from all sorts of different places. And then it will just sort of say, ah, okay, now I know the path to receive this more, or to, to reach this more specific route. But, but the problem is always there, there is this uh, router which speaks multiple protocols and, uh, and uh, it knows best like, you know, how to go to the internal traffic. Right? It's always external and internal, right? Uh, I think so. Okay. Um, yeah, typically uh, in this situation you would have the router would then just be participating in multiple routing protocols and then it can then aggregate all of these informations, uh, all of these routes into one uh, routing information base for itself. And what do you use for, uh, for those protocols to talk to each other? Uh, you can use route redistribution, uh, but typically that is not preferred. Uh, you're better off to have this router participating in each of the protocols and aggregating the information into itself. And you know this uh, like uh, manually computer. You call coffee with this how how it aggregates then or the um, because the it, the router will receive all of these prefixes from let's say OSPF and perhaps you know RIP or ISIS, whatever other BGP protocols are running, and then based on the uh, whole various criteria it will choose the one to install into its routing information base, and then it will then build from all of these all of these various paths, it will then build the forwarding information base based on the criteria that you define. But it still sounds like there is some language Yeah, like it will come down to your preference and policies and, and all sorts of uh, things. Yeah, there's no magic uh, really way. It's, uh, you, it's a preference really more than anything. Um, there are some you know, basic rules as in prefer this route over this route, but again, that comes down to route selection process. But at the end of the day, the router is participating in each of these routing protocols is the ideal way to do it. Mm. <coughs> because, I don't know, uh, because I think, as I see it, it would be really great if, the, if we would be able to uh, have exactly this situation. We have a mesh of OSR and then mesh of vapor, and then again mesh of OSR, and then they all, all can speak, you know, because we don't know what if the person can start with it. Space. Yes, as long as you have like separate uh, cyber ranges, yeah. more ranges, and announce them, like, um, yeah, but how yeah. the, hmm? <laughs> I think the problem is when we have, uh, when the, um, let's say, mesh of meshes, so we see each routing protocol as a small group of nodes and they are somehow connected. As long as this connection is a tree, we will have no problems because every prefix of each net will have only one direction to go. As soon we have multiple... No, that's not correct. We do have, you are able, if you have just two meshes, and you do paragraph redistribution between the two, if you have two routers at the border, which you usually will do, you can get root and root between the two. Okay, the situation is very simple. You will have one mesh, this mesh will be redistributing and hence advertising. And once you get the stuff that is advertised over one router that is re advertised back in the other mesh over the other router, you have a chance of running to use the run the risk of having the router. Now, the standard solution to that, what people do with BGP, is not to redistribute stuff, but to have a perfect fine assigned to every network yeah, and yeah, has yeah. on each border yeah. router is uh, advertised the program. Now, the trouble with that, there are two troubles, two problems with that, which are first, that you are assuming that every mesh is connected at all times. So if you have the mesh on the left, which is separated into two meshes, you cannot transmit over the other mesh in order to reconnect them. I'm just, I'm just, uh, the other issue you run is what happens when one of the two routers has one of its interfaces payment. Since you're unconditionally advertising the whole range, you're going to create a black hole. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, sure, but, but, we, but here we, we have routers with bad and good quality links, no? So if one router which is on the farthest edge of some edge, announce that, you know, 
And because it's in the far side of hash, it sees some other uh, mesh. But hang on, aren't we like, you know, saying all the time, uh, this might happen uh, because uh, it breaks there, uh, and therefore we want to have a better solution. What about if this breaks there, then fix it there, you know? <laughs> No, because what we are saying here is mostly that there are different trade-offs and we are outlining and we are trying to understand what the trade-offs are. Okay. Now, I'm with you on that one, okay. that this is the right thing to do, okay. Okay. but uh, you have to understand what the trade-offs are going out. and that's all in the back. No, but the problem with this fixing here is, yeah, if you are thinking about mesh, it works in the sense that, that they are deployed so that, I don't know, you have a maintainer for the node and the fixed node and so on. But I am thinking more was from the my mission migration was from the mobile phones. Where people move around, you know. Uh, and then now you imagine that you have a OLED chart mesh and uh, and then somebody with mobile phone things inside and it um. connects to okay you, you cannot say that aha uh -huh, great you fix it now okay I think this is so contrary to any the structure of how the external protocols and internal protocols speak to each other. Yeah, exactly. So, so that, I, I said, if we have like maintained mesh networks in the sense that we have, uh, uh, or, uh, that we can manually configure each and, and say, okay, you're seeing that other mesh network, let's redistribute and, and configure, then it is easier. But what I'm searching for, like in DIA, is a way that you will be able to have like, Imagine this is the best engineering. Like you have a population of people with Android phones, each of them has some program which different of us made for their own protocols. And then you want that when these people are together, they can speak to each other. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I'm also not sure, but I'm opening the question and, and the rest of the question. I think the pro the problem with this is when we start redistributing redistributed routes. So as long as we are only saying uh, I redistribute my own routes of the network, that's fine. Yeah. So the other network can jump to my network, but it will stay there. But as soon as we have transit networks, so I say I'm redistributing an, an IP range or an IP address that's not on my mesh, but on a different one, then you get the problem that you cannot easily um, exchange the concepts of distance and then you might get into looping. Uh, so that, that's why that's, that's I think the, the, that's this is a difficulty because different networks might have different opinions how far away something is. If you don't distribute this information when redistributing the routes then you might get the situation that this multiple redistribution which you need for transit networks will get you into a lot of trouble. But I think this is in the internet done all the time mm -hmm. with BGP and autonomous systems. Mm -hmm. and the original address is in one AS mm -hmm. and it's forwarded. The, the point I think with the internet is the internet has a hierarchy of networks. So it has the BGP layer that looks with this autonomous system but it doesn't have some intermediate, uh, intermediate most likely intermediate connections. So you handle the route for yourself, or you go to a layer higher and handle it there, but you don't have loops in this, in this one. You don't have loops with BGB because uh, there is a... Uh, and these, these routing updates, which uh, tell you you have to travel via this AS and via this AS, it includes all the AS numbers, as far as I understand. Yeah, but uh, but there's no. It's not that with VGP. When you go to an address A, you say, "Hmm, I could directly go to the autonomous system of this thing, or I could go to autonomous system five, then travel to its internal network, come out of another autonomous system, and travel around." So you have a hierarchy. You have the VGP layer up there, and some autonomous systems below, and that's a tree structure. And in a tree, you cannot have a loop because there's only you can only you stay inside the VGP layer and then drop into one of the networks below, but ne you, you never go uh, from one of the networks below through BGP, through a transit network below, again to BGP and Are you back. sure about that? Because I don't think you would ever actually leave BGP though within that network. It's mm -hmm. still running between uh, internal BGP. Yes, with it's OSPF clouds in between, and they are 
the higher layer it might be BGP. But I think the decision between this autonomous system where to move it is still a BGP decision. It's all BGP, but it's traveling via several autonomous systems. So no of the autonomous systems is redistributing the route it got from the BGP layer. It only redistributes its local routes, and with this you prevent this looping problem. Sure, but if in our mesh clouds we don't use OSPF, but our routing protocols and the higher layer is BGP, yep. then we can do this. Even with the scenario described that we have one cloud OSR, one cloud Batman, mm -hmm. one cloud Bubble, and uh, the BGP will only perceive as a BGP border gateway so, yeah. or gate if you use BGP, systems, if but you it will not know that there's a and, uh, yes, but an intermediate segment network. Yeah, but if you still have you have this autonomous systems with, with our routing protocols and then use an upper layer of BGP to connect them, then you cannot have a loop because you, uh, you, are, you are either in one autonomous system or you move up to the BGP layer and the BGP layer force you to run through a series of autonomous systems and the autonomous systems don't have any control about leaving their autonomous system, because that's done with BGP. Yeah, but then we should do this way, and then the problem is solved. Yeah, that would be if you use Quire, for example, mm -hmm. just yeah. redistributing our local net prefixes to a upper hierarchy level of routing. Yeah. And so. <coughs> but can this automate, uh, um, generate a uh, uh, the divorce out of the box and then just plug in the router or no? No, it would require quite a bit of configuration. Exactly. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if we this could be automated, but... It's good with PGP. You really usually um, um, you know, do a peering agreement, uh, yeah, yeah, filter yeah. rules and all these things. <coughs> that's good, because it makes clever things. It makes... Uh, yes. Yeah, so that if someone makes a mistake, it doesn't... Exactly. But I think we might be able to do this for our case automatically. We just have to make sure that every mesh cloud has a standardized way to tell the IP layer its subnet range. So every time the mesh cloud detects some BGP layer that is used for the distribution, it can uh, tell them, okay, I'm this subnet and I would like to announce a new autonomous system and please uh, tell me if someone else is out there. The problem is if as soon as two mesh networks announce the same or similar or overlapping prefixes, then you are uh, then you need well, some kind of mechanism that says, sorry, you cannot announce this. Well, at that stuff. point, BGP, if it's BGP coming in, it will, based on its policy, it will say, oh, I've got, a, I mean, with BGP, you're intending to have multiple paths to multiple destinations. Yeah. And so it comes in and you say, okay, I've received <coughs> but two, two paths to this. Ones. Yeah. Well, potentially, yes, you, you can receive the same. Yeah. I mean, at the and end of the day, it's only going to be one prefix, but it can come to you from many different ways. And so there, is a method, there are algorithms for choosing which of these paths you wish to take. And you say, I prefer this one because it's a shorter ES path length, or I choose this one because I have a policy actually that says, well, this is this circuit is, is less expensive that than makes, this one. That makes sense if the IP ranges belong finally to the same destination, but if you have MeshNet A, that is a small bunch of smartphones activated and they use the 10 slash 8 range, and they announce it to BGP, and then there comes another small smartphone yeah. network. <laughs> well, this just does, does not work then. Yeah, <laughs> so we, that's the only thing we they have. Well, within a private cloud, you would. Yeah, but this isn't a private cloud you're talking about. It's connecting private clouds together and it's no private. It's public. So you've got to have public IP addresses all announced. Or a, a registry to keep track yeah. of that, so you do yeah. not have the same prefixes but deployed in multiple that's, places. That's a, that's a problem. Can somebody please say IPv6? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so maybe, maybe I, I, I should add that well, I'm the Hebrew 6 or anything. So even before we will have, we, there's two small IPs we are using. Again. Even with trying to coordinate <coughs> ourselves, we are already having conflicts and, and uh, overlapping and so on. So that, that we would imagine there will be a system which would do this automatically, it's quite uh, impossible, it's practically impossible. So what I'm saying here, maybe, uh, what, we are, uh, what we are thinking in there is that here yeah, you have like, um, it receives your, your mobile phone takes a uh, base of MAC address and some prefix, and, and so you can read it quite easily. Not overlap, you know, it's quite hard to do that. Especially, you know, it can be done like that. Your one application, you are 
user is using to use one prefix and the other is using the other prefix or something like that. But uh, there was a uh, there was for hand. Yeah, just wanted to raise maybe you guys should write something or draw something. Yeah, <laughs> so I try to get more uh, graphical yeah, for the rest of the people. Uh, that's why I brought this because I think that uh, it is maybe easier to say to, to discuss these loops, for example, or why would mm -hmm. they have to get there to do something mm -hmm. Just from from what I understand you raised the point where one model uh, knows we move from the uh, this screen to this front of the box. Yeah, so there's no the idea is yeah, what what I am the city is we should uh, I will be broken okay. in this task. Okay. Uh, what if I am a city where which has like I don't know three clouds and then one here and so on and then all the star and all the star and the Batman and uh, and then I have an app and I I want as a user who doesn't know anything about fashion networks. I just know that this is a cool thing, and they are saying that I can zero config uh, with just a press button connect to every other device which is doing the same. But we don't have the same protocol, so what we are doing, so I am here, and I press it. But somehow one solution will be that on my mobile phone, I run all of them. That we somehow manage to get one application which has already protocols and they are just uh, listening to announcements and so on and they start running. But the question is, if I connect here to OSR, how can I talk to Batman? You must just run both protocols and build uh, a, a routing information based on what you are receiving from both sides. Yeah, but here, if, can, if I'm here and I don't see any announcements for Batman, so I'm outside of Batman. I see only OSR, but I want to talk with him. So probably this means that on this border somewhere, they have to nodes which are announcing each other, okay? If you don't have nodes which are both networks, you don't have overlap between the clouds. Yeah, and what I'm saying is, yeah, and so we have two, two, two things. We have here in this feature, we have some nodes which are in both sides, okay? And we can probably configure them to work like this. So that when I'm in OSR and running four protocols, for me, from my perspective, my mobile phone, there's only OSR. The those don't announce something outside, it doesn't care for me, okay? This is one feature. But the other feature is what if I'm having like OSR here, so a small cloud, and then go here, and I'm here with mobile phone, and I can see both of those. How can I automatically become a bridge between those? Okay. The reason why this is maybe is because this cloud is a bunch of mobile phones, and this cloud is a bunch of mobile phones. They're just using a different application. I think we're talking about two different problems. Yeah. <coughs> the first is uh, to, de uh, to detect somehow not only there's a mesh net nearby, but also how can I use it. So not only we need the ESSID, we need some. We would need some. Standardized way to tell it's, you can use this protocol on this mesh cloud and you need this prefix. So, a way to spread the basic configuration you need to join a network to nodes not already inside the network. So, every uh, node must somehow publish this. So, it's a configuration protocol for high network, which is something like that. We have configuration you need Does list. your protocol support information which really protocol should I use? You can, uh, it currently doesn't. The first version is the next decided it's not useful. But it can easily be added. It just yeah. floods a set of TLVs across the network and there's nothing preventing you from adding a TLV. So, what are the arguments why you decided it's not useful? Because I decided that I want, so the problem with that is that it means that you have to have a complicated a configuration in which uh, the demons are started in a given order. You have to first start the HCP daemon and only then can you, and only after HCP has configured, has found yeah. a configuration, can you start the routing daemon. And I decided that it's much simpler to just have a configuration in which you start both demons simultaneously and don't worry about ordering. 
the other question might be, is it really that wasteful to run two or three routing protocols on the same node? If you have no neighbors, most of our routing protocols get pretty trivial in terms of CPU power, packages, and most likely even RAM. Because when, I, when you run all this R and you receive not a single hello around you, then the only thing the routing demon is doing every few seconds it sends a single hello. It is a very short package, there's nothing inside, just saying, I'm here, there's someone out there. And so, and it doesn't consume, uh, it most likely will not consume a measurable amount of CPU. That's the power. Mm -hmm. um, don't, don't worry about that. The, the problem is with um, real node um, battery power is that either you sleep and then you, then you do anything and the CPU goes down or you run. And if you run, most of the you might be sleeping like I was doing lots of measurements again, yeah? If you run, it doesn't matter if you send or not, the Wi-Fi chip consumes anyway. So most of the time, there's hardly any difference if it sends or not. It's you want to actually turn off the Wi-Fi chip. For most current Wi-Fi chips, there are some exceptions. There, there are some newer ones. I think the AKH and IK people are working on power saving modes and stuff like but that. But not in the top mode. But not in the top mode. <laughs> <laughs> the problem is receiving uh, whereas ARM Sana takes nearly as much energy as transmitting it. That's a, that's a real problem actually. Okay. So in, in that case, CP wins against all of us. I like your way of formulating it. Don't worry about it. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, okay, so the solution would be simply to run all of them at the same moment, whatever you get, you get, and from whichever you get, uh, some configuration you choose which one you want. At and least this, this could be a, so we could, most likely we could easily build some kind of combined stop routing daemon that just listens passively, and when it sees a single package of OSR, it starts also a routing daemon, and when, all this, when the OSR routing table is empty for more than two minutes, it just stops the routing daemon again. It should not be difficult to detect this active probing packages all of our uh, okay. protocols send mm. and say, okay, there's an OSR cloud there. Okay, but with this the problem is the configuration. Optimizing the thing. So it, 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 for now, just to make it work, it's been enough to just run. Just run all three. Yeah, yeah, yeah it was. The problem is the configuration, not the routing daemon itself. Yeah. Most of our routing demons need at least a little bit of configuration, IP prefix, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but that, that can be done yeah, yeah. with yeah. HCP or not? Mm -hmm. yeah. Router versions. What? Router versions? Router versions? From V6, ideally? No, you, 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 you just have some uh, um, protocol for autom automatic uh, configuration. Yeah. With V6, yeah. But he's not speaking to somebody else, so he doesn't hear me. <laughs> you yes. So, what we are talking about is that most of our working protocols have to have some configuration in advance to work, like uh, prefixes or something. Okay? So the question is, uh, is it useful then to run it in advance because after you get uh, configuration from HCP uh, and you have to reconfigure it and then what, re restart it? No, you don't. So um, uh, if you if you take something, if you so your routing daemon should be able to react to configuration changes. Mm -hmm. So if you take a running Babel router and you change, say, its IPv4 address, then it will properly retract the old address and announce the new address. Okay, so the model is, you start running Babel on an <coughs> unconfigured node with only a link local IPv6 address, and then it will, at its own, in its own time, configure, announce the routes and so on. So that, ha that all happens automatically. And that's our only protocols do that? Also other protocols? Batman. No, we don't have this problem. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the one question I was asking for Batman, because we, all this is not talking about on layer three. How can layer two be combined with three? Well, I have a I have a radical solution, but I guess I will be beaten up for that <laughs> one. Um, you just run Batman Advance everywhere, and then you can run any IP layer three routing daemon on top of that, 
everywhere and it will just connect all of them. It doesn't matter. So even if you have these clouds, that in advance will connect these clouds. It doesn't matter. But I think... No, no. And I have another one. If you even solve the IP problem, you can run a DHCP server. Yeah, sure. So you get IP first and then you start the whole SAR daemon. On this IP. Running a routing daemon over a routing daemon is really a bad idea. Yeah, believe me. <laughs> it's just a joke. Yeah. I know some people uh, were, were building very expensive hardware, suggesting doing this on, I think, two or three layers above each other, and I'm still hoping to convince them that's a bad idea. Okay, but something else? <laughs> Which would but be, uh, it's, it's another layer, it will be very difficult to combine. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you send out the rock as follows, the root of the not set. Um, that one is transparent. Yeah, you won't see it. The, the problem <coughs> is, I think, let's assume you have a Batman Advanced Cloud and someone starts an OLS R router on it. Every single hello of this OLS R router will be flooded to the whole Batman Advanced Cloud. That's really not useful because it will, shouldn't be necessary. So if we have a gateway between the layer 2 and layer 3 world, we should not run the layer 3 routing protocol within the layer 2 mesh cloud, otherwise we have lots and lots and lots of wasted effort. I think you all agree on that. Mm -hmm. That was just the... Yeah. So, but, but, okay, but so, how to make... So, for them, what if I have uh, mobile nodes working on in back, uh, Batman and other mobile nodes working on all the start? So what, what would be a I think this mobile node scenario is pretty unrealistic because of two reasons. One, uh, which we already discussed, is the power drain. Okay. Um, I mean, I, I don't know how, many, you know how much pain you can sustain, but I guess you know, if you have three battery packs with you, you can, <laughs> you can join the mesh network. That's, that's problem one. And the second is, um, I, I know there have been some efforts to port various uh, routing demons to you know, the, the platforms that exist in the mobile world, which tend to change rapidly. So it will be an uphill battle to always port all the demons to all the platforms that you want to support. Um, and then you have not yet supported the users that have to run all this, you know, with all the latest apps and, and whatnot. So I think this is, uh, you know, running routing demons uh, on the mobile phone, it's, uh, I'd say, challenging at best. Most, most likely the, best, the easiest way to include mobile nodes into mesh clouds is to run access points everywhere in addition to the mesh and just tell the mobile nodes, okay, here's an access point and here's one and yeah. let, let them most likely not know, know about the mesh. So, but the last year it was like a DA, it was exactly the mobile phones itself, themselves could create temporary mesh networks in sense that currently what we what the network was about, you know, that you could just switch on the, and without any configuration you get a file, send file to a friend, uh, next setting sitting to you, and it doesn't really work because you have to somehow to, to configure it yourself. Uh, and what, what I like to see is that this works, you know, that I, I'm in the airplane, I press the button, uh, and somebody else also, is there a button? You said in the airplane. Yeah. Airplane flying over the... Yeah, they, they, they okay. might throw you out of the airplane for activating the Wi-Fi. Why yeah. flying <laughs> 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 no, or not? You, it is a good private airplane, it's fine. Yeah. Uh, but it's infrared. Then you have intro you know, Have you ever traveled in the last uh, few years in an airplane? Everyone who goes in, they say, okay, now switch off all electronic devices. After you might reactivate them, but not with wireless no, access, no. so we have to deactivate that. I, I fired a few days ago here, and they said only you can use laptops and everything, only not satellite phones. That was the only exception. They said you shouldn't use it. They said, not with it. Don't use wireless like stuff, but for me, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Usually they say use it in airplane mode, which means... No, yeah, no, 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 why are you driving? Why is it off? They might take off on the front of the Typically, uh, most okay, fight. train, sorry, let's go. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes take the train, and you uh, turn off the, the, uh, the app and mobile phone, and you want to uh, play a game with uh, somebody you don't know, but it is in the same, um, same uh, uh, train, and you want that you can connect automatically, you know? So
So that I would press and I would in some time discover how five other friends have, uh, people have this attack and they are really mesh network and we can connect and we can start doing things like chatting and sending files and playing games and this. Isn't that, you know, in this scenario now is a very local cloud, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, I think for this, the, the best strategy is any layer two uh, uh, connecting in protocol like, uh, like that one or able to let this. Or, or able to let this. No, it never shows up. No, no, no it's, a, it's, a, it's the most logical thing. Do I want to have a local? None. That's it. Or, or maybe even if the cloud is even smaller, you don't need a multi hop, then you yeah. can just use something as an upcoming Wi Fi direct. So you have a cloud of nodes, and one of them, one of the Wi Fi directs, plays access point, and I they just change yeah. the access point automatically. So you okay. don't have so, multi hop, but. Okay. I agree, but what would be the better is that if this small temporary mesh comes into the side of our infrastructure mesh in the sense that we put nodes around, it would be really great that they combine. This is the thought, you know, that, that you know, if you are in the train and you have all this and then the train stops in the station and you get information, internet is available. You don't change anything, you know, because it found few of our nodes around and it, it, it detected gateways or default rules or something. So this is no, that's, yeah, you, so you have two modes of operation, local operation, where you don't have to get your access, and when you can, your train came to the station, you find one node of whichever our community has around, and it, it, it connects to it, and you get, get your access. You know? And this is something I would, I think that it would be really useful for people, you know? but I don't know if it's two of them. But yeah, we can show. We have got everybody's got the best maps and advanced and everything that we saw. Or any other protocol, in fact, that's the point, yeah. Point, yeah that, that, I don't see much more. The development advanced or we are compatible to all the other small ones. Yeah, that's the difference. You just ignore them, the others, you know. If you see that they are running, you just ignore them and you just. No, no, it's kind of a uh, <coughs> like, no, I can expand it if you want later, but it's kind of a lower layer. Yeah, I said that. Yeah, yeah. It, it, but it's, it's not ignoring them. You can do can can good routing decisions on top of the graph. Yeah. We're not yeah. very useful. Exactly. Yeah. 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 But you can, if you just want to have connectivity with your own routing protocol, it can work. Okay, so how how was the time? Yeah. No, I think. Okay, so yeah, I just want to want to raise an issue. And can I can you let me finish and then you can discuss? Okay. So I just want to raise this issue to present my ideas. I think this would be really useful for, for people you know, to be able to do these things, to these things, you know, drive the train and connect with people around. And when they stop to the train, that they get interaction because there is some of our nodes around, and all these automatically without auto configuration. I think this would be the Win situation for all of us. Uh, so, but the point is that when the train stops, you don't know in which you are, which community you are, and which uh, routing protocol that you are using there. You know? So I think we should think about such applications because this is what at the end the user wants: you know? <coughs> connect with others and connect to the internet. Yeah. Why are you so all the time in all of your scenarios? You're always assuming that you want the user to be running the mesh protocol. At no point do you take into account this model of deployment in which there, you have your mesh nodes, which are simultaneously access points, and the mobile user is just associating with one of the access points. Exactly, but the question is then, what about inside the train where there is no access point and no nodes, and you want that one of their devices, or all of their devices connect to each other? No. Of course, but on the other hand, what you are doing, if you allow your user's nodes to forward packets, you get one misconfigured firewall and you're dead. The call. Yeah. Yeah, but this is so, okay, but yeah, for, for our, our nodes it is harder. You know, we somehow believe that people will be comfortable and appropriate. 
But this is also the question of all, of all our, our protocols that there is no security, so everybody can advance, uh, announce anything and then uh, just you know, package it. No, it's, it's, not about, it's not about security in our protocols, it's that users tend to have a lot of security software that have, and they have no clue about what it is doing. Uh, like firewalls, and we have the smartphone boom right now, and I'm sure there will be soon there will be security packages that yes, that we now easy. close down yeah. a lot of stuff, and then you will be spending a lot of time explaining them, you know, turn off this and don't upgrade this, and yeah. and that's and that's no. I think the direction no that we use. Yeah. The, the easiest way for users on a train, especially if you are close to each other, might be the common Wi-Fi direct stuff. Yeah. Because it's just it doesn't need an access point because one of the Wi-Fi direct nodes will just say okay, I will be your access point, and if the node goes down, another Wi-Fi direct node will just instantly come up and say but I'm the same. Maybe it is not a bit, uh, possible that some of those automatic nodes also connect to some access point mm -hmm. for uplink. Uh, theoretically, first they they just form a group and you. Uh, I know the problem is this stuff is not has not been published, yeah. so it's pretty difficult to just get advertisement about it. And the advertisement says it can do everything, and you will free coffee from it and something like this. And so we don't know, but it might be an interesting idea if this stuff finally gets into the normal wireless line drivers to see if we can build interfaces between a large mesh cloud from our protocols. And this layer two, uh, layer, layer two stuff, so they can, uh, so we can easily. Maybe we will not even need the Wi-Fi direct stuff. We can just say we have this low, low, large cloud of access points, and must see that when the user runs between them, we have to see that the the routes are following. So, um, okay. It's a question if we really uh, how much when a user without any infrastructure wants a mesh. We have multi capability. That's a really difficult part today, and we have to see uh, how to do it because it drains the battery pretty quickly. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think that Mike now has some uh, announcements to make. Yeah. So I finished. So that's everything for today. For And in the second. It would be good if we all get out together and do the, the group photo for the for our album, for the wireless battle mesh album. But before everybody runs out and smokes a cigarette, um, just a few things to know. So tomorrow um, we will be going to a nearby location, nearby facility, to have our talks there. And there will also be the lunch served. And the lunch starts at 2 in that location, 2 o'clock in the afternoon till 4. Um, we will try to organize a shuttle transport for everyone because there are a lot of cars here. But the general meeting time would be around noon, 12. And then we try to get everyone uh, to this new facility. Those two that are not on time have to walk. It's uh, about one, one and a half kilometers from here. Okay. I think some of you already know the building. Uh, Roger showed it to some of you. I, I have not. But, um, Maybe it's good to spread the news about the timing tomorrow. Um, another thing, I know a few things, a few people of you are leaving tomorrow and we are short in beds for Sunday, for Saturday to Sunday night. So it would be nice if those people that are leaving maybe send a note to Roger that we know how many beds do we have and who's leaving. Because there will be local people that want to stay here and so we will be squeezing everyone. Uh, into the houses that we have. And leaving is the next topic. There's a wiki page um, that tries to coordinate all the people that are going back to the airport on Sunday and Saturday. It would be nice if everyone um, goes to the wiki page and adds himself for, the, um, for his departure time. So we can organize the um, shuttle to Vic and the train. Hello, is everyone with me? Yeah. What did I just say? Train! 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 Train to be less polite. Somebody doesn't take the wiki, nobody yes. will pick him up. Yes. He will stay here. Those that are not in the wiki <laughs> will have to walk back to Vic. <laughs> <laughs> so get yourself into the wiki as soon as possible. Um, and I think you, for the lunch tomorrow, we have some tickets that we want to distribute. Uh, we'll do it in the dinner. Do it in the dinner, okay. 
During the dinner, we distribute some tickets for the lunch so that you can get your lunch uh, tomorrow. Uh, just show me the ticket and you get your lunch um, at the location tomorrow. Uh, one last thing. Hello. Um, the houses, we have to return the houses in a state that is kind of acceptable. <laughs> um, it would be nice if all the glasses and the towels and all the chairs that moved around go back to the original location. And maybe there's not too much alcohol on the floor or coffee and other things. Uh, we got this low price because um, there will be nobody after us cleaning the houses. So everyone is uh, asked to do its part in putting the houses and, and the whole area back in shape as it was before we came. Okay? Yeah? <coughs> now please all converge at the uh, exit for the photo. Feeling well again? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, for the first time, well, your, your problem was a little bit better.